This is the Lydia and Spin with uh, Lydia Lunch and Tim Doll, episode number 184. Good evening, yeah. Timothy. Good evening. How are you doing? Perfect. Good, good, good. Perfect, except for this story is a little yes. bit worrying, especially you, one who comes from a fish-friendly environment up in Massachusetts. Look out. A new analysis of hundreds of freshwater fish suggests that those who eat fish could be ingesting, of course, we know this, harmful levels of Mercury? chemicals, okay. which can stay in the environment in our bodies for decades. They concluded that the consumption of just a single serving of freshwater fish per year could be equal to a month of drinking water laced with uh, PFOS, forever chemicals, at high levels that could be harmful. So what? I mean, you know, fish supposed to be healthy. Well, not at this point. Well, maybe stick to the ocean fish because... The well, the study found that freshwater fish appear to be significantly more contaminated than yeah. seafood and that the median concentration of chemicals was... 278 times higher. Jesus Christ. That was what was found in saltwater fish or shrimp or lobsters, clams, and oysters. It's uh, terrifying. Well, I mean, it's too bad. We, we had such succulent catfish when we were in Tennessee. And that's, <laughs> yeah, well, uh... we, know, we know we're, we're eating poison. Down there. <laughs> I, I mean, the, the fact that we, with eight, eight and a half billion people on the planet, we still hunt wild game like, like we did, but, but at an industrial level, but in the same kind of not style, but just uh, this kind of old school way of feeding ourselves, hunting and gathering. Yeah, it it yeah. seems it seems bizarre. Yeah, hunting, gathering, and then this another terrifying new article. Meet M Gen, a new STI going around that no one seems to be talking about. So, all right, I in don't know anything to, about it. Well, I'm about to tell you. Uh, look, in spite of COVID, flu, RSV. There has been an alarmingly sharp rise uh, in the number of sexually transmitted infections, probably post COVID as well. You and know, since Tinder, probably. Uh, absolutely. Now, okay, they, they know that they've counted, and this is such an undercount 2.5 million cases. This is in America of syphilis, chlamydia, gonorrhea in 2021, all on a steep rise. But what's worse, and especially for women, is this tiny bacteria called Mycoplasmum genitalium, and it's sometimes shortened to MGen, which usually, unfortunately, doesn't cause any symptoms. However, when it does, can trigger pain, discomfort while urinating, abdominal, uh, abdominal abnormal discharges, serious health problems, and you know, the thing is, syphilis, gonorrhea, HIV are typically tested. This is not so if you're if you're well. asymptomatic and well you're not you, going to know unless you insist that they test right. for this. And so what it, so what happens if you're you you don't know at all you don't get tested what are the long term effects? Well, the problem is it encourages other infections. For instance, right, it increases right. the risk of HIV infections. Right, right. It increases increases the risk of developing resistance, making drugs useless to fight it. Um, P, uh, you know, pelvic inflammatory disease. It's just, it's uh, very terrible. And the thing is, it's hard to treat because this bacteria lacks a cell wall. So it is able to deflect many typical antibiotics that target cell production. So, I mean, this is just, you know, uh, again, just you got to. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, like, yeah. it's like anything. It's like meat, fish or sex. You got to be safe. Well, the growing population and uh, communication and transportation, you know, where it's at, these are going to be inevitable uh, well, road, also, roadblocks. Or, well, the problem with MGen is that it uh, develops antibiotic resistance to more than one drug at a time. So it's very tricky. It's like a really, the same way that COVID has mutated and has variations. Well, this is really fair i mean the thing is so many people have this and they just don't know it but it just it piggybacks other is problems. it more common in women than men well women are more likely to get tested okay you know, annual pap smears or whatever but i mean it can lead to cervical cancers and and nice. et cetera. so i mean it's you know it's just more bad news you know gotta you know back i mean microbiological bacterial infections viruses i mean that's just where we are now and the thing is how safe can you be? be well, if, if that's going to spook all you Tinderellas out there. <laughs> um, well, maybe, bag it. <laughs> well, maybe this. Bag that shit up. According to uh, 
well, People Magazine, I think it is. Uh, <laughs> Kohlberger, the the uh, guy who was arrested, the suspect for allegedly killing the four Idaho, Idaho. State University yeah. students, frat, right. sorority people. Um, a woman claims she was on a Tinder date with Kohlberger not that long ago. And she said she was she's definitely it was him. It's like once she saw that guy, because she was kind of creeped out with this guy, like, what the hell? And they're on this date. She's like, this guy's kind of weird. I don't really like him. But then he was kind of forcing the hand, like, well, let me walk you back to your dorm room. She's like, okay. So they get back to the dorm room and he just starts, he's just awkward. He just starts keeps keeps on tickling her. And oh. she's, like, she's like, stop tickling me. And then and then he'd get all serious because like he was all joking and he all serious, like. I'm not trying to tickle you. She's like, what the hell's up with this guy? She, but she didn't know how to, she was probably a kid. She didn't know how to really deflect him. So she had this grand plan of going to the bathroom and pretending to puke like she was sick. Like, <laughs> I can't do it until he left. But then I, but then he messaged her on, I think Tinder or, or some social media shortly afterwards saying the quote was you have good birthing hips. Oh god! Yeah, and, and she's like, "What the hell's up with this guy?" Yeah, but but I, but I guess I, I guess he's been. They found out he was messaging one of the murder victims, and she wasn't responding. And and the way it works with uh, a lot of social media, if you're not like friends or you, right. proof, it's like a message request. So it's not clear if she even even knew she even knew he was trying to message her, or she was just like, "I don't give a fuck." Right. But, well, you know, this is. Not happened to us. This might have happened to some, this might have nearly happened to Simon in the past. Okay. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. So doctor forced to explain moment where man in speedos appears in his Zoom call. <laughs> a doctor was forced to explain why a man wearing only a vest and underwear turned up behind him whilst he was on an official Zoom call featuring prominent lawmakers. And of course, it's an embarrassing mishap. So uh, Dr. Matt Heinz is a doctor, but also a member of the Pima County Board of Supervisors, was the only person joining into the meeting remotely as he was on holiday in the Caribbean. So, however, the 45-year-old who worked under Barack Obama's presidential administration was left slightly red-faced after a man much younger than him turned up in the background wearing a black vest and black trunks or brief and doing a little dance. Hmm? Well... So he wanted he, to be seen, I guess. Yeah. Well, I mean, and uh, well, he wanted to be seen, but I don't think Dr. Heinz wanted no. him to be <laughs> no. seen. And then Heinz said, well, he's not a boyfriend or a sex worker. He's just, um, you know, he's just a travel companion. Oh, whatever. Come on. Come on. Put your pants on, kids. Anyway, you know, whatever. Know where the camera's pointing. Well, did you, I don't know if you read about this, the second library in Colorado was just shut down for methamphetamine contamination. And, I, and yeah, yeah. So I'm like, what does that mean? And, and, and so I, I kind of had to keep on digging into it because one in Boulder, Colorado, they're like, there's this, this whole library is toxic. It's totally contaminated with amphetamines. I'm like, what, what do you mean? It's like in the books? Like, what, what, yeah. what do you mean it's in? And so this other library just up the road, probably like a half hour away said, Maybe we should test for amphetamine, methamphetamine contamination. Sure enough, they said that the results they received were quite troubling and they had to shut it down. So I, I, was, I was like, well, there's residue. Like, like what's, yeah, going what's, go what's going on? What's going on? Well, the New York Times was a little had a little more information. I guess the, all the ventilation system, they think people were smoking like ice or, you know, like the crack version of, of, of crystal meth in the bathrooms i think they, they were going into the bathrooms and it but they've been doing it for a long long fucking time oh my and God. it's just like all through the filtration Furry systems and all, everything oh, oh yeah because someone got sick in in uh colorado so i'm like old lady like oh I, I it must have been all the old ladies that were working there they didn't realize there was a fucking speed parties were going on in those bathrooms in the library um and god could you imagine being just wired like that but in a library everyone's like whispering i mean that's uh, I don't know, but, but well, I mean, that's yeah, that's just terrible. Well, anyway, good news in science, though, is something maybe you need to check into with your base work focused sure. ultrasound. So it's a form of functional neurosurgery when the targeting of precise structures deep in the brain to change it or restore function.
depression to stop a tumor. It's also they're using it to to, uh, to uh, address depression. That so basically in a in a simple way. So there's a bunch of you know neurons in one target that are firing away uncontrollably, causing like a tremor or shakes or depression. But with focused ultrasound, it uses a transducer to force beams of sound waves to converge at one point to raise the temperature and destroy the uh the, the bad tissue so this sounds pretty i mean pretty sound good. sound tools and sound weapons I've, i always have been fascinated with those things and yeah, absolutely and yeah they they get pretty insane we, well they're saying that people who with who have tremor diagnosis that doesn't respond to other medications would be eligible to you know try this focused ultrasound treatment and these are you know in sunnybrook health centers in toronto and uh for neuromodul the center for neuromodulation so this is very very interesting here i wish they could you know shoot a beam of life into my ass pain <laughs> excuse me so you, you need a sound you need a sound weapon in your ass is what you're saying well i need to stand closer <laughs> to you on stage i think <laughs> i mean i mean yes bass frequencies can be a sound weapon for sure and and so can uh well so can a voice even so I, I mean, the, the, yeah, these weapons. Um, well, did you? I, I is there has there been any follow up to these ones that were in like this in the American Embassy in Cuba and stuff? Like, oh, the Savannah remember? Hit Syndrome. Well, I mean, look, people say they suffer from it. If you say you suffer from it, you suffer from it. I well, there's been a lot of there's been a lot of. I mean, the, the high Pentagon, officials that yeah, say, they've been attacked, but I, I haven't heard anything about it since. I haven't heard anything in a couple of months, but I mean. Uh, look, there's so many ways and there's so many waves of poisoning, whether it's forever chemicals in the fish, in the water, in the air, in the sand, in our bloodstream already, sound waves. Oh, God. Yeah. Time, well, to, time to party. <laughs> time, to, time to party. I I, I think, uh, was it Lisa Marie Presley, the one that just died? Uh, Elvis is, um, she partied a lot because her, now that she's dead and there are people going through her financial records. Oh, yeah. She, and, and she how do you believed, lose a hundred million dollars in 25 years yeah Come she on. lost a hundred million dollars and not just that she's spending like crazy because she still owns the the majority she's the majority owner of the rights of graceland which generates or was paying her a hundred thousand dollars a month and uh, and so i i don't even know what's going on i mean and she owes like two Two million in taxes. I mean, I think so. Wow. Well, she, does she now? She's dead. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know how that's going to well, work out. You know, who, who can even know what it's like to have, you know, Elvis and Priscilla as your parents? I mean, what a burden that is, anyway. Yeah, I mean, yeah. So I don't know. And then, and then of course, she was at that award ceremony that was celebrating that movie yeah. about her, her father. Well, I, I saw some pictures inside her pill cabinet, and I mean, I don't even know. I mean, how many? Whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not, yeah. not healthy. No, no, no. Too young for a cardiac arrest. Uh, oh, well. Well, uh, I, I don't know. Anything else? Uh, not really. I, I mean, mean, there's some tragic stories, but they're not so fun. I don't want to read them. Uh, well, I'm not in the mood. All right. I, I am in the mood for the humor and wit of our next guest, which is uh, Mr. Jim Sklavunis, who's been in many of my musical organizations, uh, Teenage Jesus, Beirut Slump, In Limbo, Shotgun Wedding, and played with uh, oh, the gynecologist, uh, Red Transistor, Von Elmo, Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds as of late, his own group, the Vanity. Sonic, Sonic, Sonic Youth. Sonic Youth, the Cramps at one point. I mean, yeah. So we might as well just go into the joyfulness of our next guest. And this is the Lydian Spin with Liddy Lunch. Tim Dahl, produced by Simon Slater, and episode number 184. Pay attention, kids. That's right. This is the Lydian Spin with Lydia Lunch, Tim Dahl, and special guest, one of my oldest yet youngest friends, Musician, producer, multi-instrumentalist, writer, Grammy Award nominated, probably just for being a fantastic humorist, Jim uh -huh. Sklavunis. Hello, Mr. Sklavunis. Howdy, Howdy all. Hi, Tim. How you doing? Good to see you. Good. How are you? I'm all, yeah, I'm, I'm fine. I'm fine. How are you? I am glad to hear you're fine. Yeah. I'm fine. It's, 
How how is it? You're, you're in London. Extra right? fine. You're extra fine. I'm super <laughs> fine. Super fine. <laughs> so you're in London right now. How's that going? What do you mean? How's it going? It's, Meaning, it's, like, I've been like, here for it's been here for a long time, uh, despite uh, despite my best <laughs> efforts. Right, and and it's, it's still standing. It's not as dangerous as it was, as it was like five hundred years ago. That was like that was like a real insane period in London. I you know, you when, mean when the Romans were here. Well, I mean, what I was more referring to, um, I heard that in the city of London, murder went up like eightfold when they discovered distillation for themselves like like suddenly like whiskey hit london and basically everyone just started killing each other and i still feel like when you leave a bar in uh <laughs> it, it, a pub in oh. england it's like last call and then everyone cramps six whiskeys down their throats and then the girls ha- are wearing spandex and they're eating mars bars and puking and the guys are pounding each other's faces in uh, well, um, that's certainly that's certainly true in some parts of the country, but I, I have to say they're not they're not killing each other quick enough for my uh, roar. Face. Okay. okay, cool. All right. You well, know, that, that's you know that's a universal uh, d- disposition that we might have. It's always the wrong <laughs> ones that get a bullet to their head, to to the fucking head. Uh, it's unbelievable. But you know, no matter how much murder, mayhem, war pestilence, virus, contagions, there are population is still going up. It's strange. Well, I'm we're, you and stop, I we're we're doing our fucking we're doing well <laughs> we're doing our part to make sure it doesn't well go well in a, far right. I don't know the numbers on this, but in uh China England, in England did the population numbers go down with Brexit? Um no, 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 probably not. I, but... I, I, I would. I, I don't have. I don't have the uh, data. In you know the data in front of you. Okay, okay. But uh, I haven't noticed it's any less crowded. Than, than, <laughs> yeah, it's still pretty before. dense, right? I well, how, how crowded is yes, your dense? I think dense is a good word. Den- yeah. Dense is a um, <laughs> very you appropriate know, word. Exactly. Um, how long have you been living in London now, Mister Scriven? Well, if you call it living, uh, about. Um, uh, just over a dozen years, I suppose. All right. And what what, what was? We're, I guess we're kind of gonna we're going backwards a little bit. We're gonna go backwards. Yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll eventually get to the beginning. There are and, worse and, places to go. Fair enough. Fair <laughs> enough. So sideways, upside down. What was <laughs> what instigated the move twelve years ago? Um, marriage. I I met a an English lady, my wife Sarah. Uh, we finally, we finally uh, got hitched, and yeah, it made sense to stay here. Fair enough. And do you have dual citizenship? No, I'm I'm considering it. I mean, it it with with much chagrin, it would. <laughs> but I mean, it, would, it would make my life easier in some respects. But um, uh, it's it's a. <laughs> You know, it's a bureaucratic it's a, nightmare as well. It's yeah. it's a difficult concept to want to be a citizen of any place to begin with. But Fair. Um, it sort of implies that you embrace certain things that uh, you know a, a place have come to stand for, and um, that's definitely not entirely true in my case. Well, y- you support a place that you don't that you don't have to stand for it as a place that provides easier convenience to go all the other places you usually go when you're touring because let's face it europe is where both you yeah. and i do the most amount of shows it makes sense yeah, I mean, yeah, it made sense yeah. for me to live in spain for eight years because i did most of the shows in europe it's, it's yeah. practical actually so that that's kind of why you're back and forth there's the pragmatic and practical element but then i'm a practical just, guy but that's then it. But at the core, I'm a practical, practical guy. You're a practical joker for the most part. And but at its <laughs> root, it. at, at its roots, you're not into nationalism. You're not into the idea of exceptionalism. I guess every country that exists has a view of except. They they, they think they're exceptional. Their exceptionalism is why countries exist. I always found. Well, and, I re- I believe in exceptional individuals, not exceptional. Yeah, I, was about, <laughs> I was about to say. I agree. I agree with that one one has to believe in exceptional individuals um otherwise we wouldn't be talking to each other (laughs) there you go i i agree with that too i just i just national exceptionalism always kind of rubbed me the wrong way it's just like uh, yeah like come on i mean uh, i mean there there are exceptional aspects to countries i I won't i won't deny that um 
uh, exceptional music can be made in certain places and and it's sadly lacking in others. <laughs> I, I, applaud, I applaud I applaud uh, exceptionalism where I find it. Um, but uh, it's it's not necessarily cause for um, bullying. <laughs> any any anybody else about, yeah. no no but, but i think it's okay to bully them if they're up there saying well we are this and and we want to be recognized as this ice you know this fenced well, good, in kind good, of nation i mean if they believe they're exceptional good luck bullying them uh, <laughs> good luck uh, bullying a country i mean i, I kind of well, uh, <laughs> look, look uh, i bullet I, I bully species. I bully Roar. genders. I bully almost everybody. If I have yeah, a chance. but you're Lydia Lunch. Well, somebody's <laughs> got to freaking do it. Hello, I mean, you know, guys, I can't get out of the pulpit and I can't put down the bullhorn because the situation remains exactly the freaking same as it always has. Well, so Jim, I, I, we, we're gonna maybe move from this, but I kind of want to ask if these countries do believe in their exceptionalism and they exist. Like I am this country and this is what my identity is, then that kind of allows one to make generalizations about them uh, because they're the ones that are basically setting themselves up. So you were just saying some countries uh, are much more maybe into music and more than maybe some other countries. Um, well, can you I, tell I, me, which like countries do you think that, are not into music? I, I, wanna, uh, I, I have I'd, my I'd list. Like to, I'd like to believe there are. Well, I mean, uh, right now, Afghanistan is uh, pretty anti music. But I mean, <laughs> I really like think I there are musicians and interesting music being made just about anywhere. Interesting people with interesting thoughts just about anywhere. But in terms of a national identity, it you know, some countries simply don't embrace, you know, the arts or the intellectuals or the the highly moral people that might guide them down a, a the, their people down a de better path or any of that stuff. So um, I think we're, we can't conflate uh, individual exceptionalism with national yes. exceptional exceptionalism ever, because um, it usually takes a few decades for the, uh, the high and mighty of any country to even acknowledge that, there was something good happening, you know, maybe in, uh, you know, the East Village or Soho <laughs> or, or someplace like that. You know? or, or, or the bleeding streets. Oh, maybe of I'm London. going too far by saying the East Village. Uh -huh, uh -huh. <laughs> well, let, let's let's go back now, because so many people came to New York, but you were actually born in Brooklyn. Yes. And that really I mean, I know maybe three people that were born in New York or Brooklyn, because most of us just, you know, came here out of uh, a desperate need to escape where we were from. And to you know, we just heard there was a rumbling going on. But I want to go back to what was your the earliest concerts or clubs that you went to? I mean, even before we met, which was, of course, like, I believe, 77. Yeah, that sounds about right. 76, 77, something like that. Um, well, uh, the Fillmore East. I went to the Fillmore East and saw a couple of shows there. I, I, I was a bit too late for the hippies, you know. I I totally missed the boat on the Beatniks. <laughs> Definitely too late for the hippies as well. I was just that funny, like kind of in between age. So glam. What what, what was it that? Oh, what was your... at the Fillmore East? Yeah. Well, gla glam. Uh, at the Fillmore East, I saw things like uh, Frank Zappa and the Mothers of Invention, and uh, you know. Some, some uh, it was uh, I was dependent on I was still too young to go by myself allegedly so, <laughs> so I was dependent on um, you know older friends and relatives to to bring me there um, but where I could go on my own was places like the Museum of Modern Art or Carnegie Hall which is where I saw um, for example I saw John Lee Hooker at Carnegie Hall. At Carnegie Hall. Wow. Yeah. Okay. With wow. Uh, Canned Heat. That was amazing. John Lee Hooker was astounding. Canned Heat was, was I wouldn't say they were disappointing, but um, they didn't exceed my expectations. What was the volume difference between the sets? <laughs> um, well, there was 
you know, it was it was Carnegie Hall, so it never got that loud. Right. But, but um, John Lee Hooker filled the room with his presence, and Can't Heat just seemed like a band. Dissipated it. <laughs> right. Um, it was also the first time I ever got mugged. Oh. <laughs> in in Carnegie Hall or outside? Of Carnegie just Hall. outside. Just outside. Did John Lee Hooker mug you? <laughs> that would have been great. Oh, that would have been fantastic. That's something more like what the con- of honor. That's what the contortions of Teenage Jesus would do. We'd mug the audience. When, when you when you first said canned heat, my brain went to vanilla fudge for some reason. I was like, oh no, canned heat. I was like, that would have been uh, really I weird. Wish, I wish vanilla fudge. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, what neighborhood were you? Uh, did you grow up in, in Brooklyn? Uh, it was. It's this real. Um, it was this real boondock. It still is a boondock. Um, very. I know where uh, I live. Um. It's called Mill Basin. Oh, I know Mill Basin. And you know I, Mill Basin? Oh, I know Mill Basin because there's no subway there. So exactly, exactly. And, That's and why so, it's a boondock. That's yeah. why it always stays this sort of weird little sort of um, it's working class aspiring to uh, middle class, and it's um, it's very conservative. So you'd have of, to take a bus to the subway. Yes. <laughs> oh God. Yes. That was dedication. Uh, and, and was well, the, in, the, in those days that was really running the gauntlet. Um, I don't know if you remember Lydia, but there were a few times like I got beaten up pretty badly on my way to um, <laughs> on my way to Manhattan. It was you know be you know f- a football game would be getting out, and uh, I'd just be in the wrong place at the wrong time on the wrong bus. Oh, on the bus. Oh my God. And, 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 on could, the bus. and couldn't keep my mouth shut. Like a high oh. school, like a high school football game? Wait, 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 wait. Yeah, that sort of thing. Yeah. And, well, and, and, key, and key, we, key words, couldn't keep your mouth shut. I mean, first of all, you're six, seven. You're not exactly a squirt who's going to get stomped on, but I guess it would take a football team. Well, it, it, I was also, it, you know, when you're tall, you're also a bit of a target. And if oh. you have green hair or something <laughs> right, like that. Right. Or no eyebrows, or, <laughs> <laughs> or was, was a blue King's... diaphanous sh- see-through shirt. You know, <laughs> it, you know, people notice you, and, and uh, yeah. sometimes, sometimes they, you know, sometimes they take offense for some reason. Did you continue after ge- being beaten up? Did you continue on going to Manhattan, or did you like turn around yeah, and course, like, oh, I got it? Of course, of course. So, all right, cool. So, I mean, was... I mean, I, I, Lydia and I lived together briefly. Um, uh, that was my first uh, living in Manhattan experience. How did we even get that apartment on 12th Street? And still, I remember only one night there, and I think you know the night. But first of all, how did we even get in? Well, into I, can, this- I can assure you, you spent more than one night there. Well, I mean, but there's oh. one memorable night, but we'll get into <laughs> that in a minute. But how did we even land that place? Because it was a really nice apartment until we got um, I, I found it on the uh, NYU. I was... I, I don't remember if I was still going to NYU at that point, but I found it on the NYU message board. Okay. I don't know and where I was uh, before that. And that it was you, me, Anine. Was Ch- James Chance there for a while as well? Yeah, yeah, but we he was. Couldn't, couldn't stand that. <laughs> Taha, why couldn't you stand that? I know the stories, but I don't know. Um, well, uh, James was an interesting roommate. He... Um, he he wasn't uh, bashful and he wasn't quiet. Um, he uh, used to um, he used to shave himself. I think at the behest of um, Anya Phillips, he used to shave all the hair off of his body, and he would just. Um, well, would he howl while doing so? <laughs> uh, no, no, but he. I think he got a lot of free records from some source or another. They were mostly disco records. And he'd play them one by one and, um, you know, he'd march, you know, it was a railroad flat, so all the rooms connected. So you heard everything that was going on, more or less, uh, at least on my side of the uh, of the um, apartment building. And he would march from his record player, you know, to the window and fling the rejected records out into the street. I, I don't know if you remember, Lydia, it was... Um, the uh, street had a lot of uh, action on it, a lot of uh, prostitutes. Mm. Oh, and, um, didn't notice. <laughs> no, well, it, it was it was uh, it was kind of what made it us able to carry on in 
in such a manner in the in a neighborhood that was slowly getting gentrified uh, well, our end of the street was pretty still pretty outlaw and uh okay. they, hadn't, they hadn't yet they hadn't yet built remember there was a big empty lot next door well i i, I recall like in memory it feels like i moved on up from between a and b to a, a little bit further into the numbered avenues so it felt like a move up to me yeah well, I, well it was we were gentrifying i guess uh, i guess well. we were there oh so but, we, but uh there was this big empty lot lot that that with like about a 40 foot drop out our back window because mean the window we once threw bicycles out while high yeah, on acid yeah, yeah. It, well we threw all sorts of stuff out there <laughs> garbage bicycles <laughs> nearly each other <laughs> hey, that, that's always a funny expression like uh you, you know you're on a second or third story your apartment and just to throw everything out your window is always and and if you're i think young people there's like a thrill everyone starts laughing but uh but that seems to be a connect thing that people constantly do i mean throughout history it's like yeah oh, throw it out the window i i I, th I think it was thrilling yes <laughs> yeah. back to the bicycle uh cavalcade out the window I remember that night distinctly because I think we were alone and I wish I could, I wish I had in a, written in a journal how many times that we had actually done acid together. Numerous, I mean, daily, I don't know, a year long spade, I have no idea. But I recall, I believe that we were alone, bicycle went out the window, we were calling everyone we knew, trying to get them to come over to entertain us and nobody was having that. So we entertained ourselves. But the next thing I remember is waking up at 6 a.m. in a loft bed, naked, with two cops staring at my bare, beautiful breast, going, I'm like, well, uh, excuse me, officer, is there a problem here? And they're like, we heard reports of a woman screaming, which would have been six hours before. Mm -hmm. Do you recall that night? <laughs> yeah, well, actually, I, I remember it slightly differently, Lydia, because I love your I, version. <laughs> I led I led those cops. I, I uh, they were knocking at the door rather loudly. And oh, OK. So I, I let them in, greeted them, um, led them to my room. <laughs> um, well, no, we uh, I we I let they wanted to check every room. So uh, they checked every room one by one. Um uh, Neen had a few choice words for them, uh, <laughs> and um, James fortunately wasn't home. Um, <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, your door was closed, so I knocked on the door and I said, "Lydia, there's some police officers here <laughs> to see you." And your words were, "I quote, tell them to come in here and fuck me." Ah! <laughs> Whoa! Wow! Well. And what was there, what, what, what? How did the cops react to that? Like they always do in fear and desperation. <laughs> um, well, they were taken aback. <laughs> nice. All right, well, but, we, but, but, but they we did, did go in. But, they did enter. They did. They did go in. They uh, they <laughs> flashed their flashlights around and um, asked how could, if they, you how could they resist? Asked if you were okay. I think a few more wise cracks were exchanged. <laughs> But um, yeah, it was, okay. you know, it was um, <laughs> it was annoying because um, I had just managed to go to sleep <laughs> after, you know, our day started with um, we took the acid fairly early in the day, and um, um, <clears throat> we had had some fun with uh, some food coloring. I don't remember. No, I don't remember, <laughs> that. Don't remember uh, that at all. Some red food coloring. Uh, so. Um, um the late glenn bronca um was, was there too by. okay well he dropped by to why uh, <laughs> well he i had made arrangements he wanted some uh flyers some uh poster art that um i had done i don't remember which band of ours it was but gynecologist um, Were you still no no it was, a, no it was uh, one of our bands oh Okay. So it must have been it must have been Teenage Jesus. Maybe it okay. was Derek Slump. I don't remember. Probably Teenage Jesus. Mm -hmm. so I had done some poster flyers things, and he was collecting mm. uh, these. And uh, he had arranged to come over at a certain time. So he did, and uh, I greeted him with a, a, a quite a bit of exuberance with the uh, red coloring, dye, red vegetable dye coloring all over my face. <laughs> He was oh he was he was somewhat um dismayed. Um 
and a bit um, concerned, but I assured mm -hmm. him everything was a okay, tip top. <laughs> Handed him the flyers, and I don't think I ever saw him again. Uh, right. I don't. I don't think I saw him again until uh, he came to the Teenage Jesus reunion many years later. That you mean Thurston did it? Oh, was he fell, there? Oh. Fell to his knees and said. You are a rock god or something. And I said, get off your fucking knees. No, I'm not. I don't remember. I don't know. Anyway, need, needless to say, <laughs> we had a lot of fun. I don't know how much as we do do, but I feel that it it has led us, unlike so many of my other friends, to kind of avoid a lot of depression, which has befallen them, because that expansion or joy that at the time good LSD brought was just something that then lives in your cells. Yeah, I, I'll buy into that. Um, you know, I guess we weren't really exactly microdosing, but uh, no, no. But there must have been some residual, um, residual of uh, positive effects. Do now, you still do you still uh, dabble in psychedelics every now and then? Uh, I wouldn't know really where to get them, and most of the drugs I've tried since then have been uh, slightly disappointing. Um, okay. Uh, it, it's so much easier to to make a nice cocktail at home <laughs> fair, fair than enough. to go out hunting for drugs. Uh, uh, they're they're <laughs> just not what they once were. Jim, now let's go back because they're probably better. Well, I, well, they, they, that's a whole uh, other conversation. Well, you have to really, know where to look. At uh, not really. But no, but, but anyway, no, 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 no. Anyway, look, when we first met and the for the first time when you were writing for and had founded No Magazine, you know mm -hmm. there were very some very good rock magazines, periodicals at that time, you were playing, I believe, were you playing the saxophone? Yes, I was. And I have to say, your saxophone playing on In Limbo is still so beautiful and mournful. And I have to go back and hear that record occasionally. I think that was the first record Weasel Walter got of my uh, of my <laughs> output. And I don't know why, whenever he was 12 years old, he wanted such, you know, I wanted to make the slowest record ever made. But I still think it's a really beautiful record. And, but how did you go from saxophone, bass, drums? I mean, you you play so many instruments. I mean, well, just um, natural natural talent. Uh, naturally, uh, naturally foolhardy. I think is more like it. Um, I'll I'll take a whack at anything. Really, is is the honest answer. But um, I I I quite liked. Uh, avant-garde jazz and uh, anything noisy when I was a kid. Uh, by kid, I mean like a teenager. And uh, when I first saw Teenage Jesus and the Jerks, James was still in the lineup. And skronking I, away, skronking away. I had I had approached you because my uh, fellow No Magazine um, editor uh, and writer. Yeah, all all, all the others were a bit intimidated by you. And they, they said, oh, Mimi, you go and talk to him, uh, to her. Um, it, you go talk they, to her. Them. them <laughs> it. Um, you, you'll, you'll talk to anybody. <laughs> You've already been beaten up on the bus. What's there to fear? She's only yeah, like so, five foot four. You're six foot seven. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, I was, I was very happy too, because I was, uh, you know, very much enamored of the band. And, um, and your fine self. And so we arranged for an interview. I don't remember, I don't remember where or how we did it, but I I I um I remember diligently transcribing it and then uh and then Chris Nelson, the uh, the editor of No Magazine, like tearing the entire interview to pieces and how dare and, and pasting it in a very random and chaotic way all <laughs> over no magazine number three issue number three so there wasn't much continuity but there's plenty of quotes in there um uh, all about um you know leading uh armies of children <laughs> to, to the new armageddon or things like that um, i was an idealist <laughs> but anyway i mean you i mm -hmm. i want to make a a, a short story long i I wanted to play uh, saxophone in uh, Teenage Jesus and the Jerks, and I approached you about it, I think, maybe at the artist space um, shows that I was doing with the gynecologists. Which was a and, band with Glenn Branca. Uh, no, actually, it was oh, with Reese, Reese with Chatterman, Chatterman. Reese oh, Chatterman. Yeah. and uh, Nina Canal, oh, who yeah. later was in Ut. 
uh, and Robert Appleton, who was a British poet. Um, but uh, yeah, I approached you and you said, um, you said, no. <laughs> you said, I don't want a sax player. I want- Because oh, James was already I'm, out of the band at that point. Yeah, and and uh, um, I'm, I'm firing Gordon Stevenson um, in a couple of days. It was like a couple of days <laughs> before the uh, No New York recordings. Because he called Teenage Jesus an art band. <laughs> And that's I, why I fired so him. I, I, I love that. <laughs> and actually, I just read an fired. interview with I just read an interview with you where you said we were anti art. And that that's why you were invited in, because because I think that you like me, we have an understanding of the absurd. Thank well, you. <laughs> Hands. I don't know <laughs> if I understand it, but I certainly uh, can recognize it. Promote, well, certainly, I certainly have a fondness for it. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, needless but, but anyway, to... you said you said uh, get play the play the bass. Did you and... have did you even have a bass? Where did no. how did we find a bass? I didn't even uh, have a guitar. I don't think. Anin had a bass. <laughs> okay, so, so she said you can you can play my bass, and uh, and by play, uh, you know that I guess that term has to be taken pretty loosely because um, I I played it quite percussively. Although I did play notes, I was, I was you were the best. Player. You were the best bass player. Teenage but Jesus but the percussive uh, attack, you know, was important to the sound. Added a lot of impact. Well, thank you, thank you, guys. Um, Absolutely. But, um, I had a, I had a, I had a certain technique. Yeah. <laughs> didn't the, didn't we all? Um, <laughs> let's talk about the first, maybe even the only true horror core band, Beirut Slump, which, you know, Thurwell once described so accurately as a slug crawling across a razor blade. Um, it was just, it just seemed obvious. And this is how we work anyway. And still to this day, doing more than one thing at a time, we were all doing many things at once, but in difference to teenage Jesus, uh, Bobby and Liz Swope, brother and sister, they seem like just some backwoods hillbillies. It just seemed appropriate to form a band with them. And I have to this day thought that most of the words were taken from homeless people that Bobby Swope ran into. And he said <laughs> some of them, but do you remember the show? And we only did three shows, but we rehearsed for a year. We were very tight. You played drums in that, correct? Yeah. yeah. And um, uh, do you remember the one show we did where a homeless person actually got up and started singing with Bobby? Yes, I do vaguely. And people remember. thought that was plan a plant, but it just seemed appropriate that hut, 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 it made sense. Well, that to... might have been his co-writer. <laughs> well, know? that's what I thought. <laughs> <laughs> that's what, I think we only did three shows, and that was more than enough. Uh, the recordings. I, I only remember one, to be honest. And, and, well, it's and, like and it's, I barely it's, remember that. It's like um, my night at Twelfth Street with you. I only remember one, but I know there was more. Selective <laughs> memory. <laughs> Well, why not just go for the best one possible? So you only remember the one where the homeless dude got up and started singing. Exactly. Yeah. Makes sense. <laughs> I, by the way, I uh, I saw Liz Swope a couple of years ago. Yeah, I, she's now like a hospice nurse. Yeah, yeah. And and we I saw out, I, I I sought her out in Nashville. And, and we ran into Bobby Swope recently in Mexico City, where he became very oh, wow. successful as a vintage furniture dealer and. He lives in a fabulous place and has released a few books, uh, as a oh, matter wow. of fact, one on a box he found at a flea market of this transvestite club, like suburban dads on the weekend going to upstate and becoming ladies for the weekend. And he found a, a box of these photos and published it and found the woman that actually led this uh, contingent and published books. So, yeah, very, very interesting. You know, this is there's more of that going on than, of course, than uh, uh, anybody, anybody wants to hit it too. anybody wants to admit, and um, um, probably well, probably a lot of Republicans are <laughs> sure. I mean, it, admit or or I think I think you know this is my optimist side. I think a lot of shit out there, people just let it happen. It's not until well, you know, maybe the, Republicans or, or, or religious people are like, hey, stop doing this. But most, most yeah, of the time, come, 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 coming up on the New York dolls, I mean, I, I still like boys that look like girls and wear makeup and, yeah, so cute. That boys, call them what you will, boys, girls, boyish girls, they, them, it, whatever they want to be called. It's cute. Anything that 
does it box its own self in to a hole or hole itself in to a box that other put themselves in. I'm all for it. Well, the, the, you know, the feminine look is, is quite a powerful look. And, and so when are you going to shave your beard? Well, <laughs> I think I missed my chance to, uh, to sort of let my uh, inner woman shine through. I think when I was, when I was a younger fella. Well, I, I think it's I might definitely, have, I might have uh, dazzled a few few eyes but i think it would have been now, seven foot tall in some high stilettos it would have been amazing no but there's a chance again because i think on the on the incline you can really <laughs> boys can kind of take on that feminine kind of look and then kind of on the well, decline a lot, a too. Lot older, can... a lot of older guys end up looking like old women yeah exactly that's what i'm going in for so it's like paul mccartney or something well, well I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm gonna I, wait i'm gonna wait a couple of years before i explore that avenue and look <laughs> i believe that people should embrace all parts of their personality and should we don't i don't know why i don't see why we have to have even one definition much less 40 i think you should just be allowed to be however weird you want to be inside or out of the closet the house the club whatever leave us the freak alone that's all i know just be what you are whatever that is what i am i've been in drag my whole life honey have you noticed well, even with your, with your green hair and shaved eyebrows yeah. being picked on in Mill Basin, going to the Lower East Side or Alphabet City or the East Village, which could be rough. Well, of course, you said it was gentrifying. <laughs> well, did you get? Was it more rough in Mill Basin at, at, as a youth, or was it more rough uh, hanging in the well, Lower let me, East Side? Let me, let me put it this way: the first time I had a gun drawn on me was right down the street, right down the block from my um, from my parents' house. Okay, so. Okay. Yeah, I'd say it was equally rough, possibly rougher. Remember, in those days, Brooklyn was someplace that nobody went to. Right. You know, well, and also the poverty, the prejudice, the bankruptcy of the city, just, you know, the bullyism. It was well, this is what was so weird that people that weren't in New York at that point don't realize how the streets, especially the Lower East Side, every five steps, someone, if you were a woman, would be harassing you. I mean, literally every five steps. Hey, baby, are you married? You want to go on a date? I mean, I became a stand-up comedian just walking down the streets because I'd make them laugh because I realized I couldn't punch all their freaking lights out, maybe <laughs> one at a time, and would just be halfway down the street while they'd be laughing. And it was the only way you could deal with it because, you know, how else are you going to deal with it? And plus, I think mostly, like, as was right, they were probably terrified of me in a mini skirt and cowboy boots. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I I think people don't like you know things that seem strange to them, and um, you know their natural reaction is fear and uh, and sometimes violence. Yeah, violence. So was Kings Plaza around when you were growing up? That's like the uh, kind of a shopping area. That you know, Mill Basin used to be quite a quaint place, you know, uh, right. like almost like a sleepy fishing village. There right. was like, like a small uh, sort of harbor there with, yeah. the, you know, boats would go in and out of a lot. Some of it was industrial. Some of it was commercial fishing. Some of it was just, you know, leisure, leisure, uh, um, leisure crafts. But um, uh, from from the earliest I can remember where King's Plaza was standing, there was a uh, an abandoned Volkswagen uh, showroom. And it was like about three stories tall. And we used to ride our bikes inside this uh, cool. abandoned building and like, you know, because it had ramps all over the place. So we just like used to tear ass all over it. And um Jim, where were you during the blackout of 77, which is such a fond memory for me of <laughs> that um, three day rampage? I was I was in Manhattan. Um, I was in Manhattan. Uh, there was. Um, I'm not sure if I'm mixing it up with another blackout, but uh, but we were in the no office. We had to make our way down. Uh, several flights yeah. <laughs> when i say the no office uh we were borrowing like uh chris nelson had an uncle and who had an office in this uh skyscraper in uh, midtown manhattan and uh we used to borrow it you know after midnight and um yeah we were we were in there when the when uh, the blackout happened because um 
I guess we were trying to put an issue to to bed or something, and uh, <laughs> there was there was some uh, funny encounters with some house, you know, like uh, some uh, cleaners that we had to some Puerto Rican cleaners that we had to lead to safety down. <laughs> <laughs> I think that was seventy-seven. I'm, I can't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it, must, if, it, must, if you, it must have been. It must have been yeah, seventy. If you were doing no magazine, it must have been because yeah, there was a blackout a few years later. Tim, I want to. I want to go back to your multi-instrumental mania, and also how many different kinds of bands and music that you produce. So let's go back to before Teenage Jesus Beirut Slump. I mean, you were in The Gynecologist with Reese Chatham and, and Nina Cannell. You were in Red Transistor for a while. And I mean, That's if right. anybody, that, do you know that uh, Weasel and Tim played with Von Elmo for a while recently? I, I, I knew I knew that Weasel did. I didn't know you did. Tim. Oh, yes. And I was getting lucky uh, boy. Well, I, the messages I was getting from him were quite entertaining, too. And then uh, and then he everything about him is entertaining. Oh, yes. Supposedly he, he claims. Because we were we were gonna do some big show, he he wiped out in a. I shouldn't laugh because if it's true, but in a motorcycle accident, and, and but it's not. You don't know. And then he, nobody 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 knows what's true. And, and then and then he said, but then right afterwards, you'll be like, well, now I gotta go to Spain. I got this lawyer, and Sony owes me five million dollars. <laughs> it's like, what's going on? He owes the music industry five million dollars for the atrocity he committed against the name of it if you ask me but i i i, I think let's not I think, impugn uh, the fine name of von elmo uh, now. well let's and and rudolph, and rudolph the man's a pioneer in I what mean, in um, <laughs> absurdism and well you have to, i have to i have to give him that that's true so who else at that period you were can in i any... just tell you uh, that the the uh, first time I saw Von Elmo play drums, he used to be in a band called Congress, if you remember them. Okay, I don't know. With Otto Von Ruggins. <laughs> and, and I was, um, I was myself and my friend Kip, we were kind of aspiring roadies at that point, believe it or not. <laughs> so we wanted to be on the road crew for Congress. So they, they humored us and let us hang, <laughs> hang around their rehearsals. We never actually did any roadying for them. But um, my introduction to Von Elmo was um, this man with sunglasses and a bald head and both his feet and casts lumbered in on, on the crutches, <laughs> made his way to a drum kit that was wrapped in chains, a double double kick drum, yeah. drum kit, kit. One for uh, each cast. <laughs> <laughs> One for each cast. And uh, proceeded to... to pound away at it in the in the most unseemly manner just like uh ferocious playing w with his casts and everything uh it uh, i had the opportunity to speak to him afterwards and he told me that he had broken his legs jumping out his window <laughs> that, that sounds about right on that's acid a, or not that sounds whatever. about right well i mean did you he got beaten up pretty badly because he took a loan right to uh to play some big show at oh you know, you know all right we'll get into <laughs> the von elmo story is too convoluted yeah, yeah. complicated I mean, the von elmo it. stories are endless but yeah, anyway yes. it was von elmo who uh who t taught me to play drums Whoa. because <laughs> he um if he could do it with two broken feet well, he he didn't really teach me in the traditional manner, Lydia. He um, he sort of um, planted his hands on my shoulders, stared deep <laughs> into my eyes, and said, "You are a drummer. Now play." That that was much and easier I, than what I had to do with Bradley Field, which is to take his hands like a like because he didn't want to be in the band, but uh, and take his hands like a little monkey and teach him just how to pound one snare drum. So you had it easy. I should have just looked in his eyes. You're right. <laughs> Try that next time. Did you have any musical? Let's not impugn the fine name of Bradley Field. He was the best a one eyed pioneer and minimalist <laughs> drumming. Hey. There was nothing if not minimal. Were you? Did you pick up any instruments as a kid? You must have. I had a snare drum, a plastic <laughs> snare drum that was given to me as a Christmas gift one year, and I broke it in the first day. That was good training for what you were go to go on to do. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> I'd say I'd already learned everything there was to know about <laughs> drumming. About no wave. 
<laughs> and <laughs> no way. You can't yeah. do it good, do it hard. And um, I I uh, saved up from my, um, I can't remember what job I had. Uh, I had so many, but I, I, I saved up from one of my jobs and bought myself a, a crappy tenor saxophone and um, took a couple of weeks of lessons and then couldn't afford any more. So then I just kind of kept honking on it. <laughs> Biting on the reed. Yeah, just, yeah. yeah exactly. <laughs> And do you, do you still have a, a tenor saxophone? I do. I do. In fact, I bought one. I bought um, I bought uh, Paula Henderson. If you know Paula, uh, maybe you know Paula. She had a band called Moisturizer, and she sometimes plays with the Reverend Vince Anderson. Um, she's a she's kind of New York, long time New Yorker by way of Australia. Anyway, she uh, she had a, a spare saxophone. I bought her her old tenor. So at what period, say the early period, how many bands were you in at one time? I mean, that's just what we did. You know, we did a lot of things at once. Was there a, or did one lead to the other? Uh, I I don't remember, exactly. to be honest. I mean, they, well, they Beirut just, Slump and Teenage Jesus were at the same time, just Beirut Slump rarely played out, but. Yeah, and, and there was overlap with Red, Trans, Red Transistor and Teenage Jesus. In fact, uh, the reason I was fired from Red Transistor was because Von Elmo was was convinced I would be uh, uh, conveying all of his musical secret knowledge ah. to, to you. Uh, well, you know the one. So, <laughs> so yeah, right. Well, trusted. let's let's put it this way: I learned nothing from him. But I I recall so, one day. See, I, I'm quite I'm I was quite forthright. I didn't I didn't uh, success didn't reveal any of those secrets. I I did one one day at that loft that Bradley Field and I lived in on Delancey Street. I remember having a session where I played drums and Rudolph Gray played guitar, or maybe we both played guitar. I wish I had that tape. But who could hear anything? I mean, that that, that would have been just sheer chaos. Uh, one of the craziest sessions I ever did was me, Sumner Crane, and Rudolph. Sumner Crane of my favorite band of all time, Mars. What, what was so crazy, crazy about the session? Oh, just the music was the music was so out there. I didn't, you know, I just was the there was, you know, you the personalities were pretty out there. The music was according accordingly so, and um, I just did my best to kind of anchor it in something that, that, you know, made Were some... you playing drums for that? Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. Did it you was... see, did you ever see all the styles of painting? It wasn't that's... free jazz. I'll, I'll tell you that. <laughs> it, was, it wasn't free jazz. I, it was like something I'd never heard before. Did you ever see all the different styles that Sumner Crane painted? And I think he painted in seven yeah. different personalities. Yeah. Yeah. Remember the yeah. Was the, well, his, <laughs> The, the His music. Uh, apartment was crazy. That like Chinese storefront, Chinese laundry, right? Yeah, it, it, it was, and uh, the the floor was covered, carpeted in books. As I well, maybe uh, maybe I visited him at a later stage than when <laughs> you you were <laughs> socializing with him. I I'll, I don't recall, but. It could possibly have very well been. He, um, he, it was it was towards the end of his tenure and his tenancy in this uh, in this uh, this, uh, place, which I think was on West Fourth Street. It was around it, uh, east, sorry, east East, yeah, east was, Fourth East around, Fourth Street. Around but the, the floor, it was a mess. It was the <laughs> complete tip. Do, do you remember what show you went to first at Max's or CBGB's? Because we were talking um, about you had no magazine, so the scene was already going. Something was already happening. Um, I don't remember the very first one, but it was a very, it was uh, for sure one of the very early on ones was Talking Heads, who I just kind of randomly kind of encountered. Who were very uh, interesting early yeah. on when they were sparse and, and yeah, so when they were nervous. Three piece. three piece, they were fantastic. What, what are some of the other shows that you thought were really stellar of that period that you saw? Well, Mars and Teenage Absolutely. Jesus and the Jerks and the Contortions and um, DNA when uh, Tim Wright joined. I didn't much care for the uh, earlier version of it. It was okay, I guess. I don't want to be cruel, but you know, it, I, I much preferred it with Tim Wright. What uh, about Manster? Oh, Perubu. 
Manster were fantastic. You know, I I, I mean, Manster, I Did have. you know and, them? Well, <laughs> go back to Paradox oh, okay. and read the Chelsea Hotel <laughs> chapter. I had an obsession with Manster, a six foot seven singer who stood behind the drums and sang a basement torture. But also I, you know, pursued with Weasel trying to get any information on what happened to Manster. And so few people even saw them, cared about them. And it's they're like off the radar. But, oh, uh, Jack but, Ruby. Jack Ruby was another early one. Which was George uh, George Scott. Yeah, yeah. Fantastic band. Um, yeah, Manster just kind of disappeared. Mm, they, no, they, they, they were so they're on that They're on that really dodgy uh, live at CBGB's. It, uh, terrib or, terrible. It had not, none of the impact that it did live. Yeah. Did you see Suicide very early on? Yeah, definitely. Definitely. In fact, Max is in, fact, manly, I, right? in fact, now I'm remembering that was what lured me to CBGB's was I saw two ads in the in the, the Village Voice. One was for suicide at one point and another one was for television. And uh, I, I thought, OK, these both look pretty, pretty strange bands. The music maybe is quite strange, too. Let me take a chance on it. <laughs> take the bus Suicide to the subway the point uh television i thought was a bit like the grateful dead you ever see ozone ozone no okay. <laughs> or ozone. Uh, paul paul zone's brother's band <laughs> oh no no i didn't know he had i didn't very glam every song sounded like a cover a weasel produced something recently of their like long lost tapes oh wow um, yeah we, at, at no i only knew the fast Right, right, right. So, uh, well, why don't the two of you tell me about Devil Dogs? Because I, I know, uh, well, I, I know very little about Devil Dogs. Look, the best part about Devil Dogs is this: it was Robert Quine that suggested the songs we should do. Yeah, and I remember yeah. playing a cast iron frying pan. That's about all I remember. <laughs> I don't remember yeah, how I many shows so where we he, went. The, oh. Quine put together this cassette tape, and we just kind of diligently copied it, and. Um, well, I don't, wait, let's stop there for a minute. Early Richard Hell and the Voidoids. Amazing. Yeah, yeah. What a disappointment great. in modern rock that guy was. Oh, my God. <laughs> Not Robert Klein, my hero, but please. First album, stop there. And I guess he did. <laughs> yeah, basically, yeah, sadly. <laughs> so good. Um, Devil Dogs. Now, it's, you know. Yeah, oh, one question I always have is, ain't I spy? Well, what an argument. And I have to say, you know, um, Retrovirus has covered a few Eight Eyed Spy songs. And very and, nicely, I, I might add. Well, yeah. And I always had a... I, I, people love that band, and that made me really hate it, I have to say. And also, I just found it too... <laughs> I wasn't weird enough. Ever but what the a, contrarian. Well, my favorite... One of my favorite songs that I've ever played recorded, and we still do it in Retrovirus, is Dead Me UB Side, because that's how weird music should be. And once I asked an audience, I'm like... Does anybody have an idea what genre we would call this? And somebody said garage forensics. I'm like, oh, my God, exactly. Because <laughs> that is such a great and weird song. I, I guess Eight Eyes by just wasn't weird enough. I remember playing at Tier 3, one of the shows, and I had to have my leg straight out in the chest of somebody to keep the audience back. And then it became too popular. I'm like, I'm out of here. This, is, this sucks. Popular. I don't know if... It, if I don't know if I agree that Eight Eyed Spy wasn't weird enough. What what? But it did have a lot of very unresolved eclecticism. Well, people it. love that band, and I guess that's why I hated it. Yeah, well, it's good I enough, just thought maybe. it was too straight. I don't know. I don't know. Well, compared to a lot of other things, probably not. Well, but compared to a lot of other things, I did probably so. Probably so. Probably right. Plus, Pat Irwin always telling me, why don't you sing more? I'm like, why? <laughs> like trying to force me to actually sing? I'm like, oh, you got all this fucking melodic music and I'm supposed to be melodic? What is this? The shirts? Blondie? Get out. <laughs> well, there were, there, there, I guess, I guess him, it was, you know, George. George, Scott. Had a, George Scott had a vision for the band. I don't know if that vision was ever fulfilled. He was amazing. No, I don't um, think so either. But, um, you know, whatever whatever its kind of faults, inconsistencies, unresolved aspects, it was a very short-lived experiment. It, you know, 
because, like all of my musical but, adventures they well, do the also point because of, also because of george's demise so well, it, also it, because know, it's not it's only just a snapshot of a certain kind of moment right. in in our musical evolution and i i really can't remember if i had already decided i was going to la you did and, you and, did and, and, and i was i was uh i was um um I was uh, asked to convince you to rejoin and you had, con and you had, con and you said you would, but <laughs> then but I left, was, but, but no, you, you were coming, you were, go you were, were going to uh, come back or at least you said you were. <laughs> yeah. You said you were, but you didn't have to because George died then. Well, that, there you go. And then I formed 1313. So yeah, there would be exactly. no reason to, <laughs> go back to that no there wasn't much to go back to but we did re we did re readjourn for um a sort of um strange lopsided studio session with mm. Bob Blank, mm. Mm. which was um well was i just think whatever the potential of that band was it never lived up to it people liked it for whatever reason there was always something wrong with it, in my opinion. But it we only existed for eight months. Give but it did. I, how long does a band have to exist for? We wrote songs, we recorded them, we toured. Hello, goodbye. Well, next. Teenage Jesus existed for how many years? Like four years. Well, I have no idea, but we had to get it right, and we did. Yeah. Well, I, I'm not going to make any. I'm not going to make excuses for eight nights, boy, Lydia. Who doesn't want to play? I mean. Come on, that's just what should be heard in music to abolish all the rest I'm, of it. I'm right. always playing that. That's true. <laughs> well, um, nothing wrong with that. So you just kept on your, I don't know, what was the curiosity is, is why you're just joining all these bands one after the other, some on top of each other? He was a very if, charismatic oddball and people loved him and they wanted him around. I was, um, <laughs> I was promiscuous. A promiscuous musician. Yes. I hope I inspired that. You did, but, but 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 not like a. And I had I had more than I had more than my share of dalliances, musical dalliances <laughs> with you. There's still time for more. <laughs> but being a being a promiscuous musician that that wants to express themselves for whatever they're trying to express, versus say like a a major working session musician who, who basically is promiscuous but it's maybe more like like a musical sociopath because <laughs> they're, they're they're just totally okay with doing celine dion right next to maybe a david bowie record or something i mean that's top session guys or, or women will play basically with everyone but that's a very different promiscuous you're kind of on the scene and you wanted to roll well, around I'm, with I'm, I'm very i'm very uh I, I take a very earnest interest in bands that I think that are unique and uh, something that anything that kind of connects with me in a, in a certain way, I want to be able to make a contribution to it. And, um, and you do. And, and you I, do. I, and I, um, I'm, I know my limitations as a musician. I strive to, ex to, you know, transcend them, but I know my limitations. But one of the things I try the utmost to do is to try to you know just become part of that thing that that i'm i'm liking so much about this band and not try to change it any in any way well also also jim you're a very neutralizing character because you're extremely funny uh, you're not egotistical. You have worked with a lot of different maniacs and you're a very balancing. I know it's bizarre to say, but you're a very balancing force and you're very, you're not, it's not that you're neutral like Switzerland, but there's something, <laughs> there's something about you. Holes. <laughs> there's a, something about you. That's just very balancing. Maybe because again, your sense of absurdity or the reason you join anything to begin with. So then eventually you had to form your own group, the Vanity Set, where you then took to the stage singing and speaking and um, proliferating in a very different way, showing your kind of Lee Hazelwood roots, which you continue to do to this day. I mean, obviously we've all been affected and infected. So what? tell us about Vanity Set for a minute. Well, the vanity set. I had, um, you know, I had joined. Uh, I had been uh, um, 
invited to join Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds at, at a certain point. Um, and it came just in the nick of time because I was really down on my luck. So uh, the very first record I made with the band was this um, album called Murder Ballads. And we had some guest singers on it. And one of those guest singers was Kylie Minogue. And wow. Kylie Minogue um, sang a duet with Nick on one song. And I played on that song. And my very first royalty check <laughs> was was substantial because um because of kylie's uh pop status popularity, yeah popularity i guess um so, was she, she was like a soap opera star before she was a oh, she was, she was in this show yeah, called she was uh, what was she in neighbors from australia yeah yeah yeah, yeah. she was like a, yeah some t yeah. tv show yeah yeah and then she was a sort of a disco pop star pop singer i should be so lucky and all this kind of stuff um, but anyway, um, I, you know, it was the very first time I'd ever gotten, you know, a substantial amount of money from, um, uh, from making music ever. And, uh, I didn't know what to do with it. So I decided to make a record <laughs> mm -hmm. and, uh, I, I spent it really fast. Yeah. How, <laughs> how long did the vanity set go on for though? Because, and you know, how, how, how long was that? Was that about th about three years uh, on and off because uh, I was busy going back and forth to uh, the UK and and touring with the, the Bad Seeds. And, and how did you feel it was about hard to, hard to keep a band together when you're you know? I want to go back to your now. stage. You, if so, you go from instrumentation to writing songs, but also singing. And now, what made you decide? Okay, time for me to step out from behind the drums, the saxophone, the maracas, the whatever. Well, and... I started out as a singer because I couldn't do anything else. Um... <laughs> when, when was this karaoke in Mill Basin at 12? Uh, I mean... <laughs> this was uh, Mimi and the Dreamboats. Oh, correct. And, okay. and the reason we formed No Magazine was we had this wild notion that we would, you know, we would promote our own band <laughs> by having this kind of uh, fanzine. And, for it. For it and feature ourselves in it. And we very, very quickly dumped the idea of promoting ourselves and just <laughs> started enjoying going out every night because uh, it meant we could get on guest lists and, you know, hang out and drink. <laughs> Do you ever remember paying to get into any club back in those days? I don't. I don't. I, I ask people this no, all the time. Not in those we were days, we no. were underage. They didn't even necessarily know who we were. We would just go into all these clubs. They'd let us in. I I mean, there was just that's how it was. You think we're gonna pay? Get out of here. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you could usually blag your way into a place, even if there was some resistance. But I mean, there was some very nice door people, you know, some very they wanted us young cuties very, in there, very accommodating people uh, at the at the door at Max's and um, and CBGB's. And the, those are the places we wanted to be. So where were the first shows or what was the first album that you played with Nick Cave was Murder Ballads? Yeah. Is that the first invitation? And were yeah. you playing drums on that or just in, 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 you know, played, percussion? I, I played a, a little bit of drums. I played on two songs, Stagger Lee, which mm -hmm. was one we, of the best songs from that album. We still do we still do that occasionally, occasionally. And uh a song called Crow Jane. It was um Tommy Thomas Vidler was the uh drummer, and uh but he and I knew each other. Uh, you know Tommy. And um, he was very generous and and easygoing about it, and um, and you know the Mick and Nick knew me from their birthday party days because we, you and I, had toured with them uh, on their last. Um, yes, we did on their on the birthday party's last tour of the U.S. Um, really, what? Who yeah. did? What did we do? You, who? you and I. What did remember? we do in limbo? Uh, we did some stuff from in limbo yeah yeah i had a little keyboard we were i think there was playback and i had a little keyboard and a saxophone and you uh sang well birthday party were and remain one of my favorite bands as roland s howard one of my favorite songwriters and guitar players i must say so that's how i met roland and that's how i met nick and mick 
and uh, yeah, I and have to I, say, I, I don't, rem I don't remember for years until you know, <laughs> years later. I don't remember those shows at all. <laughs> you remember yeah. liking them? You, well, you... well, I remember the birthday party because I moved to London to chase after Roland S. Howard and which, of course, successfully. Uh, but you don't remember your your performances. I don't remember the performances with with Jim opening for them. And where do we play <laughs> three shows? I can't remember. Neither can I. Don't remember nothing. I'm sure. About I'm sure there's a website devoted to it somewhere. From, up from the archives, <laughs> we'll have to check that. But anyway, um, but then again, oh, so so what about with Shotgun Wedding? So you were playing with Nick Cave. When did Shotgun Wedding come into that? Because I had recorded that in New Orleans with Roland. Oh, that was before the Bad Seeds. Oh, okay, I that was before the Bad Seeds. Bad Seeds. Yeah, you you had done. You had the the that uh, lineup that appeared on the album. And then we were coming uh, to Europe. Somehow yeah. we got in touch and uh, I went to Europe with you and uh, you and Roland and uh, Harry and, and Harry, who I saw recently. Harry Howard, um, Roland's and, brother. Uh, Link, 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 <laughs> Link, <laughs> Link Benka. Um, Those were great shows. Yeah. Yeah. That was a lot of fun, that tour. Um, and yeah. Uh, so it couldn't have been long after that that then the Nick Cave invitation came. Yeah. It, well, yes and no. Yes and no. It was a couple of years, actually. Um, Seconds. In, between, in the in blink between, of a cat's was, eye. In between, there was uh, Reckless Eric. And, uh, you went on tour or just the album or what? You were on tour with Reckless Eric? I went on tour with him. There was Congo Norvell, which was Kid Congo's band. With which Sal was a beautiful Bell. band. Yeah, that was Thank very you. beautiful. Very noir. Very very um twin peaks and there was um i uh i rejoined the panther burns for briefly Jeff falco right Jeff falco's panther well, burns. just one second now kid just released his memoir when can we expect yours um i'm waiting for a few more people to die so i can really rip into and, it. and then and then you could just <laughs> quote shim carol and say this is for the people that died died <laughs> you know they're all guilty living or dead no but i don't know i i it's it's um I, I should i should write one while i can still remember things well, how does and, how does defamation work if someone's dead can like they're Parent, their their siblings or kids. If it's true, it's not defamation, right? Yeah. Well, well I'll, I'll say, say also, Jim, if because I say you're, it's true. <laughs> hey, Jim, you're such a you're such a good storyteller, and this is what I tell people when I do sometimes spoken word workshops: is not everybody can write a good story, but people can certainly tell a good story, and an easy way to get a book done. I mean, look, you have no problem getting work done is to just record the stories telling somebody else and then transcribe them. You got the goods, my friend. You got the goods. I'm waiting. I'll gladly write well, the forward. I, I did want to. I, I came across a cachet of um, of um, journals, published, uh, unpublished, no wave, no, no era, no magazine era photos that Anine had taken. And she and I did want to do a, a book of photos. And I was going to start with a sort of. Um, a brief uh, memoir of that era. Um, so Zora, I, Zora, I Zora, still Zora, I'm still planning to do that. Zora the other night was telling me about this article you wrote after like one of the Teenage Jesus tours. I don't know where it appeared. Oh, she yeah, was saying how great New it York was. Rocker. I'm like, I'm like, it's I gotta see this. Rocker. I gotta <laughs> see this. She was uh, <laughs> saying how great that was. You know, I just released something with Zora. She's a, a friend and a fan of yours as well. Um, the yeah, circle the, is a nice girl. The circle goes round and round. So, um, okay, Reckless Eric, Panther Burns, Congo Nervelle. You played on a Marianne Faithful. So, what what was the Marianne Faithful thing? Oh, that was that was just a, a, a spur of the moment session. I, I ran into uh, her band at, at an Italian restaurant down the street from from our house, from our flat here in London, and uh, they said, "Oh, you're doing anything." We, we're doing a song. We need we we need we need somebody to play drums. So I just. What year was that? Do you remember? Remember. Uh, well, there's a new Marianne. No, Faithful. I mean, I I, I I had I had played with Marianne before that with okay. uh, Nick Nick and Warren and uh, Marty, basically okay. Grinder Man. Uh, we we uh, backed up Marianne on a, a few songs on one of her albums, but 
I can't remember which album. She's made so many records. Well, you know, there's a new tribute record coming out to Marianne Faithful, who's unfortunately now in hospice, that Tanya Pearson, who wrote The Oral History of Women in Rock, has put together. Shirley Manson, Sylvia Black, Adele Bertay, myself, covering songs that Marianne Faithful did. Most of them she didn't write. That's to support, because I don't know why fucking Keith Richards or Mick Jagger won't just pay for the rest of her life, you goddamn rich cock-sucking motherfuckers. Yeah, what's up with that? Well, oh, uh, hello. <laughs> you know you know this, Jim, as well as I do. The more money people have, the less likely they are to give you any. Well, I I do have a track for Tanya. I don't know how to get in touch with her. Well, I will. We do. I do. Yeah, well, let's, let's convene after this, because... Uh, uh, Mark- you have an unreleased track? Unreleased track that I recorded with Nicole Atkins of uh, of a song that Marianne had covered. Which a one? Waits, a Tom Waits song. Which one? Strange Weather. I it might already be covered, but still we can get it to her. I did. Fuck, uh, fuck I that. Did, Ours I, is better. <laughs> well, here I did Love, Life, and Money, which the version with Doctor John and Johnny Winter. I don't even think I had heard a Johnny Winter song before. That's what I covered. It's going to be gra- <laughs> Johnny Winter. Love, Life, and Money. <laughs> I never heard Johnny Winter, but you know me. I love those cover songs. So what's what's now? What's happening like right now? First of all, did you survive COVID? I didn't get it. Did you get yeah, it? Yeah, I, I got it. Um, it wasn't it wasn't any biggie. Um, <laughs> I'm not saying it what it wouldn't have been for other people, but it was right. it was just but, like a mild, just like a mild cold. That's but, good. What what's coming up next? What's in the near I'm, future? I'm working on a solo record. Well, and I heard your holiday song, which was, you know, uh, released New Year's Day. Was that 2021? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, one, one year and one month ago. Yeah, yeah. You're, you're really going towards your Lee Hazelwood vibe. Uh, not, not entirely. I mean, I, I do have, I do have, uh, uh, you know, I don't know what soft, else to compare it to. Well, since, since I do you're have a soft, soft side, Lydia. I'm so not do, all hey, hard as nails. Hey, I have a soft side too. You felt it. You know it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, since you're a <laughs> since you're a multi instrumentalist, is it a tr- is it truly a solo record? Are you playing all the instruments? No, I'm not playing all the instruments. I'm playing a lot of them, but uh, I'm working very closely with a, a, fel- a pianist, uh, Dave Sherman, in uh, New York. He's he's uh, he's even co-written a song with me on it. Um, it's it's. Um, it's still a work in progress. I, I'm about halfway done with it. So, uh, so is it, I don't is know it, what, I, is it, I kind of write them and then record them. And, um, and is it like holiday song, which is slightly melancholic yet still something very endearing about it? Is this the vibe? There's, you're a, going couple, there's a couple of songs like that. Uh, then there's some which are as cold as ice. Mm. Well, I would say you could rub those against me anytime, <laughs> but I like the warm ones too. You know me. Mm, There's a lot of hate in the record. There's a lot of hate in it. I, I got to say that. But it's, not, no it's at- not hate core, the genre. <laughs> no, it's not hate core. <laughs> <laughs> if only. <laughs> Well, my friend, it's always a pleasure to be in your company, even if by remote, I must say. It's very a... good to see you. It's, it's very good to see you, Tim. Thank you Likewise. for inviting me on. And let's not forget, you have your podcast. So what does your podcast consist of? It's on Soho Radio. How often does that come out? Uh, once a month, because it's it's too, uh, it's too much of a pain in the ass to do it more than that. Yeah, well, we do it once a week. So do you have you have guests and you play music on it? Yeah, well, normally I have guests. Sometimes I have guests. Uh, sometimes I just play music. Um, but um, yeah, uh, it's it's what whoever I want to have on and whatever I want to play. So it can be anything from. Um, it can be any from anything from Adam and the Ants to Giannis Zanakis. It's, uh, it, it's it really a wide, doesn't... wide berth. Well, the it thing is, it's really kind matter. of it's kind of back to your roots originally as a journalist with no magazine. It's kind yeah. of it's kind of a full circle. And I feel that right now, these podcasts, which is why Tim and I, there's going to be like 180, whatever. It's important to do it because people want to know. They're interested. There's still a minority that we're catering to. And the minority is important. It always has been, in in my opinion. And there's just not as many good. I mean, for instance, we found out about all that great stuff as kids 
whether it was through Cream Magazine, Roxane, the New York Rocker, or the Village Voice. And now it's just so disparate that at least with doing these podcasts, we try to go, well, you know, there are some things you may or may not know and go go at it. I it's literally, important. I literally, uh, my life changing, one of my life changing musical moments was literally, I found it in the gutter. It was a, a scrap of paper. I was walking my dog, princess. <laughs> And uh, I found I saw this spot, this scrap of colorful paper in the gutter and it was raining and it was wet. And I picked it up and it was just this little scrap of paper. And it said, Iggy Stooge and the Psychedelic Stooges. This band is crazy. The guy comes out in, this, in a dress and he throws up on people and he runs all over the stage half naked. And I was like, wow, I have to find out what this is all about. <laughs> whoa okay and you did and here and we I are did. and i did <laughs> you know and I, you know it it didn't disappoint and um it led me on a kind Something... of a trajectory that i uh, hadn't really kind of had no gleaning of up until that point but that sounds it's pretty symbolic or, or a metaphor for just your existence right you kind of go with you you have a hunch, you see something colorful you or something, for it. and you're like, hey, and I'm going to check it out this out. The gutter. I'm going to check it out, and I'm going to, and if it's, you know, it grabs even more upon first inspection, you kind of go deeper in. Well, yeah. all right, Mr. Sklavunis, there's still deeper to go, and I will be here awaiting well, your call. It. And here, <laughs> and nobody can go as deep as you do, and I know oh. that. This is the Lydian Spin <laughs> with Lydia Lunch, Tim Dahl, and Mr. Master Jim Sklavunis. Thank you so much. Bye, y'all. Bye. Bye. Hey, real quickly, what uh, out of the Darmstadt school, is Zanakis your favorite out of all those? Composers is he Darmstadt? I thought that I thought I thought well, Stockhausen, Boulez, they were all I thought Zanakis, they all they all went there because he was more Zanakis was more connected with Ircom. I I was drawn to Zanakis because of the the Greek name. Ah, okay, Okay, being half Greek and half Italian. All right, yeah, and and uh, and then I heard the music and I was I was just like blown away. Shit, exactly. More coming, no doubt. Thank you.